song, I started thinking about, and you probably had this happen to, ch- happen to you as well, as when you're reading the Bible, you know, we always come across these really huge, long names that are just so hard to pronounce, right? But yet there's one name in the Bible that has all these amazing titles, like healer, savior, your defender tonight, but yet there's one simple name that you can call on, and that's Jesus. And in, and in the middle of your circumstance, that's one name that can reach down and change your life tonight. I wonder if one more time if we could lift our hands and just begin to praise that name right now. We thank you, Jesus, for the spirit that we feel in this place. God, we know you are here right now. And God, we thank you for your presence in this place. We thank you, Jesus. We thank you tonight, Jesus. Amen. Amen. It's so glad, so good to have you here. I'm glad you're here. That's what I meant to say. But it's so good to have you here tonight in church with us. If we can all stand, we're going to go to the Lord. And uh, we're going to be going to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Great job by the worship team tonight. Didn't they do a great job? Amen. And uh, they're going to be projecting the verses here for you. And it starts, we start at verse 12, and it says, So you think... So if you think you are standing firm, be careful that you don't fall. 13 says, no temptation has overtaken you except what is common to mankind. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, but when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can endure it. Then we go down to verse 21. It says, you cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons too. You cannot have part in both the Lord's table and the table of demons. 23 says, I have the right to do anything you say, but not everything is beneficial. I have the right to do anything, but not everything is constructive. No one should seek their own good, but the good of others. I want to preach to you. The trust, trust is a choice. Trust is a cho- choice. Jesus, we thank you for your presence in this place tonight, Jesus. We thank you for this opportunity that we have to gather together tonight, Jesus. We have already felt you in this place. We know you're going to do great things tonight, and we just want to be a willing spirit here tonight, Jesus, that you would work through us, that we would feel your presence in this place. We give you all the praise and all the glory. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, you may be seated. So I don't, um, some, I know some of you weren't here, and, and uh, some of you might have been, but um, last time I spoke, I shared a, a story about uh, this bike I had growing up that I crashed into my grandfather's car and, and got in trouble with. But uh, in preparing for this message tonight, I had another story about this same bike that uh, I thought would be fitting to share with you tonight. You see, I remember when I was younger, I used to have ride my bike up and down the driveway like probably a lot of you as kids did. Um, at least those with good balance did. And uh, at that time, you know, everything seemed so long. Like the driveway seemed like it was huge and the hill seemed like so steep. But now, you, now I'll pull into my grandparents and this is nothing. I don't even know how I even enjoyed this. But everything seems so much larger and bigger when you're a kid. 
But I would get on my bike and I would ride up and down the driveway. And normally what I would do is I would go to the top of the small slope there, pedal down as fast as I could. And, th and then my bike, you know, if you just push it backwards, the brakes would lock. So I would hit my brakes and then just kind of slide the back tire there. I would do this over and over during the day just to keep, s just to try to see how long I could like just slide across the gravel and leave a long mark. You know, I thought that was so cool. And I w my, my grandparents hated this though because I would do it so much that it would wear down my back tire that it was just slick. I mean, it was just like a piece of paper or something, you know, because I would just hit that gravel and slide over and over again. And also wasn't the most coordinated kid, so a lot of times that would cause me to fall and trip and all that stuff, you know, trying to be cool and whatnot. But this is one. But this one day was a little different. I was I was outside riding my bike, and my grandmother was in the yard doing something. I'm not sure what. That's not relevant to the story. But uh, I was riding my bike up and down the hill and locking my brakes up, trying to slide across the gravel. So this one time, I rode back up to the top of the slope, and I started pedaling down as fast as I could go. I had my mind up. This was going to be cool. I was going to turn those handlebars real quick and slide across the gravel. And when I hit the brakes, nothing happened, like most of the time it would. I didn't stop like normal. My pedals just started spinning backwards real quick. And I just kept picking up speed, and I looked down, and to see my chain had came off my bike. And so here I am, headed down this hill. My chains are spinning. I'm, I fly past my grandmother, who was in the yard. My feet are just sticking out, you know, straight. I'm hollering, screaming, trying to figure out a way to get off of this, trying to figure out. The smart thing would be just to put my feet down, but I was a dumb kid, so I just kept <laughs> flying down the driveway. And I'm going down, and I, I went a pretty good ways now, screaming in panic. And I look up, and we had this trailer in our, in our property that we had to storage and stuff in. And I look up, and I'm headed straight toward that thing. And I literally slam into it. My grandmother runs down and check on me to make sure I was okay and everything. But what was hilarious was that uh, when uh, I got off the bike, there was literally under the underpending of the trailer, there was my tire who had went through it, and there was my handlebars were dented into the side of it. And uh, to, to like today, they tore it down. It was still light that you could pull into the driveway and see that I had crashed into that trailer. But this got me thinking, right, because... Uh, uh, I didn't start my time clock. You know, I like to make sure I go short, so I had to start that real quick. Uh, so, if, so if I preached 15 minutes, I really went like 20 because I just started it. So, <laughs> Now this got me thinking, though, because as a kid, I wasn't expecting my chain to break, right? You, you just, as a kid, you're not thinking about those things. It was something I did daily. I rode my bike quite often. And I didn't give any thought to this. And this got me thinking because I think as adults and Christians, we kind of do the same thing, right? We, we, we tend to go through life putting faith and trust into things without even thinking about it. We put faith into money, our jobs, material things, investments, people, relationships. And we don't even realize, like, I started thinking about this, and it's really kind of scary if you think about it. I had, I had to stop just thinking about it because we get in our cars, and we go on the interstate, and we're driving 70 miles an hour with a bunch of cars and people we don't even know. We don't know who they are. We go to restaurants and eat food cooked by people we don't know. That's kind of scary if you ask me, but whatever. I mean, like I said, I, I like eating out, so I had to stop thinking about that. I was like, whatever, you know. It's food good. That's all that matters, I guess. But we put trust into things and people that we don't even really think about. It just becomes a habit for us. We develop expectations that could not be realistically met by these things and these people. Your life feels out of control, and, and just like me, you're getting ready to slam into a wall. You see, in the opening part of Corinthians that we read, it talks about standing firm. And when I first read this verse, to me it comes across as kind of being sarcastic. That was just my, my first thing I thought of when I read this, because it says, So you think you are standing firm. So you think you are standing firm. You think you've made the right decisions. You think you've made the right choices. You think you have your life all together. You think you've put your faith in the right things. And then it says, be careful that you don't fall. I feel like this is a very plain spoken way of saying, hey, there are going to be times when you think you have it all together. There are going to be times when you think you have put your trust in the right people. There are going to be times when you think you have 
that there is nothing wrong that's going to come out of this situation or the decision you've made, but out of nowhere, the chain on your bike breaks and you slam into a wall. I'm preaching tonight that I know 2018 had its ups and downs, and I believe 2019 is going to be one of the best years yet, but it's still going to come with its fair shares of ups and downs. And when you find yourself at a low point this year, I want to be able to stand back up and say, because I know I put my trust in the only one who can pick me up. When I don't understand, he's, when I don't understand what's going on, he's the only one that can stand me back up. When I feel like giving up, he's the only one there to lift me up. Yeah, amen. And I, I know what you're thinking. You don't have to say it. I'll say it, I'll say it for you. Trusting in Jesus just seems really hard to do for some reason. And as humans, it's really our natural, na- nature, yeah, nature, that's what I meant to say. I don't know what came out. But uh, for us to be vulnerable to putting our faith and trust into things that are in front of us, we like to believe what we can see. We like to be able to put our faith in the things we know is going to happen. And so the other night as I was preparing for this, I wrote down just on a piece of paper why is it hard to trust in God? And that, as I was sitting there trying to think of different things that, that could possibly be it, I came up with three. And the first one being pride. Because I don't know about you, but I hate knowing I'm wrong. Right. Courtney knows this. <laughs> but it's just hard to say, you know what? I can't fix it. I messed up. I don't have the answer, and I can't make it any better. It's hard to, to let go and say, you know what, I don't know the right answer. I don't know how to fix this. The second thing was, what we want may not be what we get. That's one of the reasons it's hard to trust Jesus. Because trusting in God means the outcome you're expecting may not be what you receive. It may cause you an adjustment in your life. It may cause you to be uncomfortable but not every battle and struggle you're going to face is going to be conquered the way you were wanting. Proverbs 3 and 5 says, Trusting, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lead not on your own understanding. Yeah. And see, that's what's h- hard about trusting God. Because right there, because we want to be able to understand and we want to know the outcome. And lastly, the third thing would, would be other people. We allow those who haven't seen the full picture, those who don't understand fully what's going on, to allow them to speak into our lives. And so on one side, we have God speaking something, and the other side, we have other people and relationships speaking the other side, and we're having to choose what outcome fits our life the best. You know, growing up, I had this idea, and and probably a lot of you as kids might have this too, but, um, you know, you see... You see Christians, and you come to church. If you grow up in church, you see the people on the platform, and you just kind of assume that they have it all together, right? You, you think, you know, we come together on Sundays, we see our friends, and we laugh, and we have a good time. And, and as a kid, I thought, you know, once you're baptized, once you have the Holy Ghost, then, then you're not going to be tempted. You're not going to be scared. To f- you're not going to be able to fall. You're not going to sin, you know, you, you would think this, right? But, but you quickly realize once you get in church and you get older, that is not the case at all. Sure. To be honest with you, I think, I think Christians actually have a harder time facing sin and temptation because we're actually battling against it rather than having to give into it. You know, in the, in the 13th verse, something is written that really kind of surprised me because it says, He, talking about God, will not let you be tempted more than you can bear. And I think a lot of times we just assume and we just kind of stop when it says he will not let you be tempted. But that's not actually the verse. It's more than you can bear. So basically it's saying God will let you be tempted at times. And as I studied this for a minute, it it answered one of my biggest questions about the Bible. And that's because I never understood when it came to the story of Adam and Eve. One, why did God put a tree in the garden that they couldn't eat? And two, why was the serpent in the garden? I've always wondered those things. Now, you know, what I'm about to say and all that stuff you may not agree with, but that's okay because I have the microphone tonight, and next time you can have the microphone. (laughs) But uh, uh, 
you're going to listen to my theory here. So we have to remember that while the earth was without sin, Adam and Eve were actually still human. They didn't know sin, but they were still human, which means they had free will. And so God places them, places them in a garden with the tree and tells them not to eat it. Not because he wanted them to sin, but to give them a choice. And I don't know if it was a week or a month or a year or five years being in the garden. Eve finds herself standing at this tree having to choose to trust what the words of God or gives in to the temptation that is standing right in front of her. See, it might not be this week. It may not be this month. It may not be the next six months. But you will eventually find yourself standing in a position where you have to give in to the temptation or trust the words of Jesus. Give in to the anxiety and depression you're facing or trust that Jesus has it under control. Give in to the lies of the enemy or trust the words Jesus has spoken to you. Trust is a choice, and tonight we have to choose what we're going to trust in. You see, you know, I can look back and see struggles and, and things that I face because of the choices I have made. I can see times where instead of trusting in what was right, I did what I thought was best. I didn't think... I don't think Eve's intention was to bring sin into the world because she didn't know what that was at the time. That was never her uh, uh, intentions. She simply thought she was making the right choice that would benefit her the most at the time. And because of that, she had to live with that the rest of her life. And I believe a lot of us tonight, myself included, have made choices in the past years that we find ourselves now having having to live with, things that we're having to go through. And it's okay, you know, it's okay to want a really good job. It's okay to want to be successful. It's okay to want to build great relationships. It's okay to want to have a lot of money. The other night we were talking about money, and someone said they didn't want to be a millionaire. I was like, that's fine. I'll take it. I don't care, you know. (laughs) They was like, I just want a couple hundred thousand. I was like, give me the million. What are you talking about? (laughs) Like, come on. But it's okay, I think, to want these things and to try to be successful. But the problem comes when we start replacing that as our trust in God. With, mat- with things and imperfect people that are not able to match or fulfill our wants and needs that only God can do. Right. So we end up feeling empty and, and alone and consumed and we're carrying burdens that we were never meant to carry because our trust has been placed in the wrong things. We want the best of both worlds. First Peter 5 and 7 says, casting all your cares upon him. I think we, intent- I think we kind of forget that, that second word there that says all. We come into service dealings with temptations and struggles, and, and we say, you know what, I'm just going to trust in Jesus tonight. I'm just going to give it to Jesus, but yet the rest of the week we're worried and trying to still figure out how to fix it. We say, you know what, tonight I'm just going to have faith in God and that he's going to work it out, but Tuesday comes and we're posting about it on Facebook. It's true, I'm friends with some of y'all. <laughs> just kidding, just kidding. Uh, no, it wasn't. Um, We find ourselves not turning it fully over to God. Now listen to me, because this is really good. I want you to understand this. You cannot have confidence in Jesus and still have control of your circumstances. You're either going to put all your faith in Jesus or continue to fight the same battles over and over. You're either going to have trust in him or go through trial after trial after trial and eventually find yourself consumed. You're either going to put your trust in him or you're going to be consumed by the circumstances that you're currently trying to control, but it's your choice. You know, I, I look back and see and see challenges I face because I wanted to control them. I see things and battles and, and things that I had to face because I thought I knew what was best. And with just being 27 days into the new year, I believe this can be our best year yet as a church, as people. I believe God has great things and for us. But before we can ever continue with this great year, I believe there has to be a release. Before you can ever trust God, you have to be willing to release everything you're worried about, you're consumed with, to Him. You know, when, when uh, God goes into the garden, and kind of going back to Adam and Eve here, when he goes back into the garden, he's looking for them. And when he finds Eve, 
now that she knows sin, it, it kind of shocked me when I read this. She didn't try to hide that she sinned like we do. When he said, what have you done? She didn't say, oh, what are you talking about? She didn't try to act innocent, but she said, I was deceived. She knew she had messed up. She knew the choices she had made caused her to know sin. And I think for a lot of us, that's what's hard. It's coming face to face with God and saying, you know what? I've been deceived. I made the wrong choices. I made a mistake, and I'm not sure how to fix it. You know what? The one thing that is, that's extremely funny to me about the day that I hit that trailer on my bicycle is, is after my, my grandmother checked on me and everything, I remember having to pull my bike out from the trailer because it's just like stuck there, right? And uh, uh, I pushed it back up to the house. My grandfather came home. He put the chain back on it, and I continued to ride my bike. I didn't leave the bike there. I didn't <laughs> develop some hatred toward bicycles. I didn't become afraid of them, you know, like every time you see a bicycle, like take out running or something. I, that, that didn't happen. It, it, you know, it happened. I slammed into the wall. I wasn't injured. I got picked it back up and kept, and kept going. Yeah. And if we can go back, I can't remember what verse I told you, but I told you a verse. If you could put that up there. Hopefully you remember which one. That, there we go. This one right here. No one should seek their own good. And pastor, it really, today when he was preaching, I was like, man, he's kind of talking along the same lines of trusting in God, even when you don't understand today. But he used this verse and, it, and says, uh, um, though he slay me, yet I will trust him. And it was, it's, 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 it's kind of scary. Cause I looked at a different translation of this and it actually says, if God kills me. I will trust him. And that's crazy for us to think because we think God would never do anything like that. We think God would never, you know, let us get burned down. But the truth is he knows how strong you are. And the truth is when it comes down to it, we have to make up in our mind, you know what, even if this thing kills me, I'm going to trust in God. And so, you know, I know... You're going to get tempted to give up this year. Let's just be honest. You know, we all are. At some point, we're going to feel tempted to give up. It may feel crazy. Your life may feel out of control like you're getting ready to slam into a wall. You may be screaming with your legs stuck out, <laughs> saying, help me, Jesus, you know. But I'm going to continue to trust that Jesus has it all under control even when I don't understand it. I'm trying to go through my notes here. Bulletins make great sermon notes, by the way. <laughs> uh. Let's all stand. That's what we'll do. We'll stand. I think one of the hardest things, though, if, if, you, d if you take anything away from from this message, don't let it be that I'm a terrible at riding a bike, but let it be that there is a choice when it comes down to it this year. If there's one choice that you find yourself struggling with this year, let it be that you're going to trust in Jesus. Amen. If there's one decision that you want to start this year off right, make that decision to trust in Jesus. Amen. If we can all pray right now, Jesus, we thank you for this time that we've had together. And God, I, God, I pray that someone was able to receive this. God, we, we just want to trust in, trust in you. It's that simple, God. We just want to make the decision to trust in your choices. God, we may not understand it. We may not know what's going on. We may not know the outcome, but we just want to trust in you. Hey, Amen. If we could, I'm asking those to want to find a place to pray we're going to gather around the front I, I just want that to be your prayer tonight that that you know when it comes whatever you're dealing with whatever situation or problem you have that you're able to turn that over to jesus that there would be a release that you could choose to trust in him
just a moment to encourage one another in prayer. Just reach over if it's appropriate. Touch your neighbor. Amen. Pray for them. Encourage them in the prayer. We need to trust in the Lord. Oh, hallelujah. Let's lift up one another. lift your hands together tonight and let's really talk to the Lord just a moment in the closing portion of this service right now God I thank you for your word I thank you oh God that we have this privilege of trusting in you today that I can go home and I can lay my head on a pillow with peace tonight knowing you're still in control you God have all power in heaven and in earth I trust you today God hallelujah praise God praise God praise God so good to be back in the house of the Lord on a Sunday night and uh, appreciate Brother Andrew preaching for us this evening. Uh, and uh, this has been scheduled for a long time. I enjoy hearing uh, these young ministers when they get a chance to speak to us and uh, appreciate the Word of God today. Um, I want to just, I, I know we've got other guests. It's good to have guests here with uh, Jeff. And I know there are other guests that have come in tonight. We did also... Um, I met these two ladies on Monday night, Sister Sonia Hankins and Catherine Gordon. Met them on Monday night here at the building. Let me just tell you, this is how the kingdom of God works. And it's a beautiful thing because this is not about really even just the Humboldt Church. This is about the church. And uh, Catherine had come in contact with First Pentecostal Church in Lexington. And uh, believe it or not, I went to their Christian school, Catherine. Uh, graduated from their school, 2006. Can't believe it's been that long. But um, so I knew Brother Nick already before Monday night. Uh, he was actually my, uh, let's see, he was the principal of my daughter. But I don't know that he was necessarily associated with the school when I was there. But I knew him because I went to school with some of his family members. And uh, so I already knew uh, some. But then uh, Catherine received the.